and uh, go ahead. Well, before anything, uh, thank you for introducing me in the most sort of neutral way possible. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, there's no Safarat agenda here, that's true. Uh, I'd like to thank you, and I, I think I'm, I'm honored because I'm included in a very eclectic group. Not too long ago, a common friend of ours, Mike Azar, who yeah. I admire, uh, took part. And I think Dan Ezzi was not too long ago as well, a week or two. Uh, I also, I offer you, I should offer the group an apology. Uh, last weekend, I think it was the night before we were scheduled, I was off to Tripoli. Uh, my grandmother passed away. So yeah. I couldn't make it. Well, thank you. Uh, but gave you my word, and here I am a week later. A bit sleep deprived. It's going to show around the eyes a bit. I woke up a bit too early this morning, and I think somebody in the group sort of joined me at four in the morning saying good morning, and you chimed in saying it's way too early to get up, which is yeah. true. You're right. It's like it's it's by now it's it's it should be your bedtime or something. Oh, Sandrella is here. Yeah. Yes, in the chat. <laughs> yeah, so this yeah. is going to be Sandrella and my bedtime story. Everyone else. Can yeah, exactly. Stay yes. I should also apologize. My, my voice is a bit gone. I've been doing too many recordings and I've been on the phone a bit too long this week. So it's not my podcast voice as per usual. I apologize. I hope everyone can hear me just fine. Before we jump into anything, uh, I'll just say up front, I think Beirut is the best story ever told. And I am biased. And I know Mahmoud's eyebrow has already sort of hinted a deep concern here, but that's fine. That's fine. I really think it's the best story ever told. The good, the bad, the beauty, the tragedy that we all know a bit too well, diversity. And when I say diversity, I mean real diversity. Open-mindedness, living next door to fundamentalists, a secularism that's extreme and a sectarianism that's equally extreme. We have consociational ideas. We have confessional ways of governing. We're cosmopolitan. And I think we're cosmopolitan in the true sense of the meaning. We are the most cosmopolitan part of this part of the world. We're one of the most cosmopolitan parts of the world, period. We're Arab and I'll go a bit sort of, I'll take a leap of faith here. We're European, and by that Eastern Mediterranean, in the loosest way possible. We speak four languages. We speak English, French, Arabic, Armenian, and I'll give Mahmoud an extra one here, Lebanese. We speak five. And anyone listening, there you go. He's, that's the approval from Mahmoud. Check out his Bill Lebanani stuff. So up to five languages spoken, sometimes at relative ease, 18 sects, 18 particular confessions is quite the mosaic for a small piece of real estate. Europeans live among us. We have Greeks, we have Armenians. We used to have Jews living with us. Now more, mostly they fly above us, reminding us that they're still here. We have prosperity. We have pure misery. Our history and our modernity is defined by each in equal measure, prosper prosperity and ruin. But that's our story. And for better or worse, I live in that story. Whether I'm here in Beirut or for the last few years back and forth from New York, I spent years in the UK as well, and I'll get a bit into that. Regardless of where I am on this planet, this story is part of my life. And I'd like to start by offering a very personal take. Uh, I think storytelling in principle is the most joyous profession. The more subjective, the better, the more sensitive, the bigger the rewards. Academia was never my thing. And I apologize to the few researchers in this group. I've seen a few names. And I think Mahmoud is chuckling here because somewhere deep down, he fully agrees. Research was not my thing. I tried and I failed. But storytelling, I'm okay at, at least. I'll claim to be an amateur, at least. And this story, oops, I'll make sure this is opening. And this slide is showing now, Mahmoud, just to confirm? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Just wanna make sure it's, it's working. Yeah. 
this story has been told for many, many years. I'm not the first, I'm just one of many. And I like to look back in time a bit to broadcasters, not podcasters like myself or like you, Mahmoud, we're sort of, uh, we're the new generation. I like going back in time. And one person in particular from the 1960s, Omar Zenni, a radio program that he would start by saying, Life is a series of tales and stories and fables and memories. Those old photos of you, we know so well. From tourist shops and bookstores, from postcards outdated, the city's prime and eminence and enhanced sepia and chrome. Your recognition going back to late Ottoman rule and a great war that would end its reign. We rose in you to demand a chance at our nation. Before we named you Martyrs Square, you were Budaj, the tower, the geographic heart of a calm Eastern Mediterranean town, now more than 100,000 inhabitants. The Turks didn't tolerate our nationalist gestures. Two years into that war and halfway past famine and fear, journalists, politicians left hanging for three days, punishing our spirit and reminding us of the empire's grip. Yet you gave birth to our purpose. We returned to you repeatedly on a weekly basis, calling on the Turks to retreat and how soon we were divided along conflicting lines. Mountain Lebanese, coastal Syrians, unable to forge common identity. Protesters making a choice, either Syrian Arab or Lebanese nationalist, Christian or Muslim. Half of us joined an Arab uprising sweeping the region from modern day Syria to Saudi Arabia. Half of us wanted to detach from the region and pursue greater Lebanon. Division did not stop us though. We changed the course of history. And by 1918, we were ready to revolt. In your midst, we, in, <laughs> sorry, in your heart, we claimed Lebanon and Arabs, the Arab uprising's finest hour. By the way, this is all coming from my head. So I'm, uh, I apologize for the occasional slip. We set up elder meetings and attempt at forging common meaning. We worked to define a shared identity and emerge together to rebuild from the war. And shortly thereafter, we were robbed of that passion. British, French bombs fell from above, crippling the empire from within. And the French arrived months later, laying claim to our sovereignty. A Turkish colony or a French mandate. This was now only temporary. We knew occupation would not last. Our ongoing revolution would need you to regain strength and challenge the world over. And history moved rapidly between those two world wars. Two decades later, we were ready for battle. Two years into the Second World War, we demanded freedom. We worked tirelessly at uniting our religions. Shada Khouri of Mount Lebanon, a Christian with dreams of independence from French rule, with recognition that the coast would need reassurance in a shared country. Riyad Sadah, a Muslim from Saida, able to see the mountain's demands, willing to be both Lebanese and Arab at once. Sovereignty now possible, a constitution agreed, the national pact. Thought through without today's think tanks or conflict resolution panels. No offense to the academics in the group. Before the UN, before the talking heads on CNN, and before academics of ivory tower or experts of geopolitical power. Khouri, Salah, they managed on their own. The French threw them in jail together. They spent months in confinement in the Eastern Barren Hills, yet they never relented. They gave us our confidence. Thousands of us gathered in your midst daily, demanding their release. The French shot at us, arrested us in droves. We were undeterred. In the middle of their European war, the French released our prisoners and retreated from the region. November 22nd, 1943, Shara Khouri Riyad Salah, our first president and prime minister, declared independence from France. And from the heart of Beirut, we gathered in your square. And with jubilation in your presence, we named you Martyrs Square.
we changed you right away. From simplicity, relished in history, we invested in your fame. We gave you your majesty, your statue, with liberty embracing the country. A torch, a flame, martyrs fallen below. A tribute to the two uprisings behind us, the foundations of our country. A reminder of the sacrifice and the price we endured. You became our nightlife, our movie district. Films from Cairo and Hollywood budding side to side. You did the work for us. You bridged our divide. We removed symbols of Turkish tutelage and embraced French facades. The Paris of the Middle East, days of architectural beauty. Tarbouche tossed aside in favor of bow and necktie. And we moved forward fast, letting go of the past. We jammed you with our traffic and lined you with sidewalk cafes, sharing you with the region's best writers. Egyptian, Iraqi, Syrian, Palestinian poets seeking refuge in our city, now famed for its liberty. They escaped regional disorder and crowded you with their dreams. We held them as our own and you cared for their plight because we were proud of our consociational democracy, the Switzerland of the Middle East. In your midst, we could never tell who belonged to what religion. It didn't matter. We knew that without you, our commonalities would disappear. And that, of course, is history. We tore you up during the Civil War. We gave you carnage and gore. We made you the front line between the newly divided East and West Beirut. We let our fighters loose, a rampage of 15 years, battling over your terrain, littering you with landmines and corpse. Only stray dogs surviving. The rest of us saw you if we dared cross over, risking our lives to maintain some unity and reminisce about our short-lived story. Christian, Muslim names now defined who lived where. Syrian, Israeli bombs pummeled you to memory. From 1975 to 1989, you hid in shame. You hid among trees growing inside you, trees growing in abandoned buildings, on fallen balconies, you let nature take its course. You became Khattames, the green line. But you preserved your legacy. You shielded your meaning, unwilling to let us rob that away. You protected the statue with a torn arm, bullet holes, shrapnel damage all over. Damaged, but not beyond repair. You kept it standing. And by 1990, the Syrian army took over. The country fell to their occupation. A patchwork of footnotes amended our constitution that never dealt with our structural flaws. We reemerged from our nightmare, 150,000 of us dead to a new order under Assad's rule. Sectarianism, the new norm. Sunni, Shah, Maronite, Orthodox Druze, Armenian politicians positioning themselves for protection and sway. Syrian checkpoints monitoring movement within you. We dared not discuss politics, joining Syria and suffocation. We were too afraid to look to you for answers. We cowered in shame. And in those years, in our hasty attempts at economic revival, we made sure you'd never be the same. We leveled all that was left of your better days. We opted for renewal rather than renovation we rushed to forget the war. Buildings that could be salvaged, we knocked over. We left you desolate. We drove past you, speeding from above, an elevated ring reuniting East and West Beirut. The statue, all that was left within you, a hint of our prouder accomplishments, now decades detached, removed for polishing, and then a victim to pathetic political bickering left in a warehouse for nearly two years, nearly forgotten, and thankfully returned in time. Because on February 14, 2005, a day none of us forget, you helped us recover our history. A truck bombing one kilometer away, assassinating Rafiq Hariri. Attempts at, attempts at paving the road immediately and hiding evidence of involvement 
suddenly met with protesters. Demonstrations, demands. The pavers stopped. The pro-Syria government forced into compromise. Inspectors granted access. Promises of reform. It wasn't enough. People now energized, marching towards you. Hariri's body buried beneath you within days. And we started camping by your side. Hundreds of us that very first night, chanting songs from our past. Thousands of us flew the cedar tree high without party slogan or confessional strand. We demanded independence once again. Days went by with the freest minds taking great risk and passion words from those defending your destiny. Samir Asir. We let tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of us in, an uprising days away. March 14, 2005, one million of us joined you. A quarter of the nation on one day together, calling on the Syrian army to leave, calling for militia to disarm, <laughs> calling for independence and calling for justice. Your heart beat that day. You reminded us of what we gave up too quickly. You gave us that third chance of getting it right. The pro-Syria government resigned. The Syrian army left behind. We set up a tribunal to deter further assassination. We engaged with Assad and Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Diplomacy and decency. But we never sacrificed our principles, our justice, our respect, no matter the consequence. The pens of our best refusing to take arms, ultimately met with the swords of zealots and despots. Samir Asir and Gibran Twaini, the first martyrs to fall. Pro-Syria groupings replaced with pro-Iranian proxies. And in the years thereafter, I told your story. Better yet, I showed your story to the thousands of guests who walked the streets with me. I navigated your tale without taking sides, and I brought you to life the best way I knew how, seating guests beneath your statue, displaying your past of the layers of history that swept the century. It's the quintessential stop for any storyteller. It's 100 years of sacrifice, told right through sunset. And I never thought for one moment you'd be anything more than the roller coaster finale. I knew your meaning in politics. I respected your purpose, but our bond was by story. It was never by blood. And that again is history. You're holding what's left of him. Buried next to Hariri, he's now in your care. The 12th assassination and that decade of death. He paid the ultimate price while extending his hand to Iran. A letter he composed, eloquent and dignified, looking for Lebanon's way out by avoiding sectarian strife. His opponents, fearful of compromise, chose to end him in broad daylight. He trusted your power. He believed in your persuasion and you provided him the tools he cherished most. The written word, expression without fear, while chants from the Arab Spring rang through his ears. You lent him your torch, he lived through your strength. With his weight above and below me, I honor that truth. Despite Lebanon's divisions, despite Lebanon's delusions, it's the place we rally our cause. It's the path to reclaim our history. And now as a storyteller, it's where I turn to preserve his passion and purpose. Pain, prosperity, triumph, and tragedy. My British 
my father, my martyr, my honor. 15 years ago, I started a walking tour in Beirut called Walk Beirut. I kept it simple. Where do you go? Beirut. Do you go to Baalbek? Beirut. How about Biblos? Beirut. Where's the bus? Walk Beirut. <laughs> I kept it very simple so there was no confusion. What started as a seven hour walking tour across the city. A long, yes, <laughs> I can see your expressions. Wow. I quickly, I quickly realized I was overdoing it. I was young. It emerged years later as a four hour walking tour. And for me, that was a sacrifice. But four hours, I think, was the right amount. This is a banyan tree, the tree of knowledge, native to India, has nothing to do with the Middle East. It's planted right outside the American University of Beirut. Mind you, there are plenty of banyan trees on that campus as well. And this university has a difficult relationship, I believe, with Mahmoud, but regardless, you taught there, I was a student there. All of us have some relationship to this university. I think it's like Lebanon, it's healthy and toxic at the same time. Fresh, fertile topsoil, tinted red. The name of the neighborhood is named after that topsoil, Hamra. For those in the group that are not Lebanese or have no connection necessarily to Lebanon, if you've been to Southern Spain, Alhambra, that red tinted stone, this is red, red tinted soil, regardless. Healthy trees can grow in Hamra. Planted here nearly 150 years ago by Protestant missionaries. They've been growing and their branches grow horizontally. The largest one in India is I believe one kilometer in width. Their roots keep growing as the branches expand and roots fall to the floor. It's the perfect place to gather in the summer months, offers shade, offers some magic in the background as well. And that's where I started my tour at the Banyan Tree. This one is just off campus. So I could get non-AUB faculty and students to meet there. Otherwise it would be impossible. This man, very important to me and I think very important to Lebanon or anyone that's curious about Lebanon's history, Kamel Salibi. And I highly recommend this book, A House of Many Mansions. He was still affiliated with AUB when I was a student there, uh, semi-retirement, but he would show up. And I was very lucky because I was a fan and by complete chance, I rented a student pension that was under his name. Lebanon has two rent systems, new rent and old rent. And the old rent is being phased out. But back then, you could still get a good deal on property in Hamra. I don't know exactly how much he was paying, but my guess is just a few hundred dollars at most for a building in Hamra. I subletted a student pension in his name and got to meet him that way. A student pension that was once a music school that he ran. It survived the civil war and shut down in the 1990s. But although it's gone, although it's been bulldozed to the ground, I have a few photos that I thought it's worth sharing. And these are photos I can get away with now and sharing. Try to ignore the Spanish lady lying down on the sofa. She's one of the guests at the pension, taking her time and enjoying her life, maybe a bit too much. But if you look behind her, you'll see a double bass parked there from the 1960s. Obviously, we were not playing music anymore. We were using it for Christmas light decoration. But it was a music school. And I managed this, I managed this student pension. And when you're managing a pension, you become the center of attention, whether you want to or not. So that's a photo of me in my better years when I was thinner and probably more attractive. Anyway, Kamel Salibi, in a way, became almost a friend, although it was a formal relationship for the most part. But when I would visit him at his home, he would share many, many stories of Beirut's past. I would take guests from the hostel, from the pension, and I would show them Beirut my way. And I got lucky, I think, because a lot of people were visiting Beirut in those years. I pulled this up. You know, it's easy to forget this. This is 11 years, 12 years ago. The New York Times listed Beirut as the number one tourism destination for the summer of 2009. Notice number two is Washington, DC. I think these two cities are not going to be visited on mass anytime soon, but 11 years ago, 
we're the top two and we were number one. When Beirut gets that kind of attention, you get a lot of people, a lot of people flying in. Not Lebanese, but pure foreigners who were just there to experience Beirut. And I kind of became the only show in town doing this regularly. So I was always at the banyan tree and people were showing up. I realized that I couldn't do this without a reservation system because suddenly there were too many people showing up at a time. And you can ignore the poor choice in clothing on my part. White pants, never wear white pants. You can make mistakes when you're in your 20s, not in your 30s. So ignoring the white pants aside, lots of people were showing up regularly. And I realized that there was demand for storytelling this way. And I was literally the only person in town. And I, I became in a way, I don't know, you know, security guards would look at me wondering who the hell is this guy walking with 80 people at a time across Beirut. But I did this day in, day out. And as you can see, I was quite thin back then. This is proof that I was not always a fat man. I used to be in shape. But the banyan trees where I always started. And I would zigzag across the city. I'm trying to show you just how big the groups are, but I can't because I could only get maybe half of them in one photo. So this is maybe half of the group. I would end the tour at the Samir Asir statue at the garden. His name was mentioned earlier in the story I shared. I'm gonna go back to that. Second to Kamal Salibi, in my opinion, another giant in Lebanese history, uh, Lebanese storytelling and a historian. He was also a professor. He was a journalist for An Nahar. Uh, he was a humble man, a quiet man for the most part who preferred the written word. Although he became political, and by June 2005, he was assassinated, hence the, hence the park in the garden. But I would end the tour there, trying to at least preserve his legacy, his commitment to Beirut, and his passion for storytelling. I think he was for many years the backbone, the inspiration I had to do the tour. And he paid the ultimate price for loving Lebanon a little too much. Second to House of Many Mansions is this book, Samir Asir's simply titled Beirut. Now, it looks user-friendly on a PDF file. This book is about, it's over 600 pages long. It's a kilo in weight, so it's a brick. It's not a book. If you're willing <laughs> to get the physical copy, it's going to maybe give you some shoulder pain. Uh, you can download it, I think, in any ebook store. But this is the manual. And I used to use this book regularly to finish my master's degree. I referenced him repeatedly. The tour ended with him. The tour celebrated his work as well. And then December, 2013, the whole tour, the whole story, everything in my life became very, very personal, too personal. And a long string of assassinations. My father is the most recent one assassinated 27th of December, 2013. And that forced me to leave Lebanon. It was the first time the city that I loved, the only place in the world that I think of as home, I left. The story got too close and it hurt, it hurt a little too much to stay put. For better or worse, I simply said goodbye, at least for a while. And while I was away, and Mahmoud, you may enjoy this, I flirted with academia. I tried pursuing a PhD in political science. And ever since meeting you, I've realized is, is you know, you don't need to do a PhD. <laughs> you, can, you can sort of ignore that altogether. I couldn't do it. I couldn't address a story unless it was personal. And reflexivity is frowned upon in academia for the most part. PhD in political science, you're encouraged to steer clear from whatever affects you emotionally. I gave it a year. Couldn't do it. Mind you, I was in the UK. So this is four years in, this, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, going to the Highlands, as remote as you can be from Beirut, trying to mentally disconnect from that story, and I simply couldn't. And while I was away, I would be sent photos like this regularly. And I love this photo. Somebody on the tour, this is, I think, 2011, took a photo of me 
And I didn't realize at first that that's my father in the tour. He had joined once discreetly with his beret. He's third from left, seated in Martyrs Square. It happens to be where he's buried. So these kinds of photos, these kinds of memories, I couldn't disconnect. It took me some time, but eventually, oh, oh, it took me some time, but eventually I did return to Beirut. And then in early 2018, I was in my element. And I want to share just two minute clip of a video taken from the tour. So you can at least get a feel for what this tour was about. started digging a little too deep and we rediscovered Beirut's Roman bathrooms. When you boil water, what happens? Steam. Steam. Steam that was trapped below the mosaic, heating the floor. Steam that seeped through the cracks, keeping Beirutis warm. <laughs> because two years later, there's no Ottoman Empire. Two years later, we're under the the French arrived to Beirut, and they came back, punishing Beirut for its role in the Arab revolt. Quickly ending Beirut's role in the Arab revolt. There's no way to completely understand Beirut, but to try to actually put it in a broader picture and to try to put it in perspective, I think that's a challenge worth taking. But to claim any authority, no way, no way. That's the persuasion of this city. You keep coming back, even when you know it's not good for you. You keep coming back. Now this video is depressing for a number of reasons. First, I realized I gained about 20 kilos ever since that video was taken, so that's horrible. I'll blame that for on COVID for the most part. Also, not too long ago, you could have all these people standing next to each other without our masks and being paranoid. So anyway, I, I hold on to that video. I was back in my element and I still technically give the tour. It's just because of COVID, because of the security breakdown, and because half the city is, is more or less blocked off and itinerary I used to follow is, is limited now. I decided to just wait and wait for things to improve. So for the time being, it's on hold. Oops. Going back to the banyan tree, without the tour, without the capability of storytelling regularly, I'm not at ease. There are many different stories I'd like to share that you cannot easily do on the tour. So I thought about this, going back to where I started at the banyan tree. How could I express Beirut in different ways? I like to keep things simple, walk Beirut, walking tour in Beirut the Beirut Banyan, <laughs> celebrating the Banyan tree that I started the tour. And this podcast begins with one person I deeply admire. I think he may be one of the most important Lebanese storytellers alive. Filmmaker, director named Ziad Dwedi. One of the best movies on Lebanese history, if I don't know if that's maybe the best way to describe it, but it's his personal story growing up in war-torn Beirut called West Beirut. I'm a big fan, as, as many people are, of his work. And I thought I would start the podcast with him. I went to him wanting to talk about film, cinema, 
I not really, I didn't feel privileged enough necessarily to go deeper. I don't know him. But for two hours, we sat down and he shared his story on his terms. Raw, deep, intimate, and almost from the gut. I couldn't get enough of it. So he set off 15 episodes that were strictly storytelling episodes. I'm going to share just a small clip from the first episode. Mind you, this is the beginning of my podcast, so it's a bit amateur, but I'll share just a snippet. The Alhambra was a very happening place. It's not like it is today. It used to have, it used to be really the center, the center of journalism, the center of culture. It was a very, very trendy street. Nowhere in Lebanon there was another equivalent street. All up the 50s, 60s and 70s, Hamra was the main center. And it had so many movie theaters. Hamra had, had the culture where the youth go out. Downtown where my dad used to have his store, you know, it was the business side. Hamra was the entertaining and the cultural part. The university is nearby, American University of Beirut, which is a huge university. And then you had the movie theater. That's the most important thing. You know, that's where you had so many movie theaters before the arrival of the multiplex. It was just uh, each building had one movie theater or two max. Yes. Cinema Hamra, Cinema Piccadilly, Cinema El Dorado, Cinema Colise, which was such a beautiful building. Today, I think about it in retrospect. Mm. It's funny because I am remembering it more now emotionally than it used to be back then. Because back then you're just a child, you're just a teenager. You don't remember, sure. you just live things. Yeah. When you take distance and you travel away and then you grow up and then uh, with time, you start thinking in details how that period was significant to the way I am now. Mm. It is so embedded in my psychology. It is the most fundamental part of my upbringing is the war between 75 and 83. I wrote a film about it called West Beirut. But when I think about it today, it's even more significant than when I wrote West Beirut. So the podcast began with him. Intimate storytelling, how he became a filmmaker, his appreciation for cinema, his memories of cinema and growing up in Beirut. And that was the theme of the podcast. And it stayed that way. Uh -huh. Until October 17, 2019, when the most recent protests began. I was in Beirut. I had my microphone. Actually, this is the replacement one, the one I had blew up because of the electricity and generator. So this is number two. Every day, recording episodes with protesters. I had a co-host with me, pretty much living in Martyrs Square, documenting the moment day in, day out. I released episodes on a daily basis with academics, with think tank experts, with all types, politicians in waiting. And really, it became a daily occurrence. Anyone who was curious about the moment and anyone seeking change, and I think I captured the moment effectively. Regularly, different themes, terrain, way beyond the initial podcast's intent. And then somewhere along the way, I met this gentleman, Mahmoud Rasmi, you may have heard of him. And I got the chance to meet you on the podcast. And for anyone who's watching right now or listening, He's updated his book. I stole this from the email I got. So that's the new cover. We even spoke about that book on one of our episodes. Anyway, the podcast took on a life of its own. And I've been doing this full time ever since the tour has been on hold. I also started exploring writing. And I've been doing this in several pieces. This is my most recent one. And I chose this one in particular. It was in Lorient Le Jour's English edition, Lorient Today. And I talk about the need for justice, especially when anyone in this country is robbed of their justice. I've sought a different route since justice is not possible for many reasons that I will get into when Resmi invites me back. He's offered another talk on another issue altogether, far more political, far more sort of state building and post-war stuff. I'll leave that to later. But the simple issue of not being able to have justice in Lebanon can drive you insane. And I've decided to sort of let that energy and, and maybe at times anger and uh, that fuel, if you will, I've sought poetic justice. 
and I use this podcast, I use the tour, I use writing, and I use storytelling in general to make sure that there's fairness and that there is a form of justice still available even when the state is collapsing before us. This is why I skipped last week, my grandmother. Uh, to anyone who still has their grandparents around, if they're lucky enough, record them. I spent two years with her permission, of course, uh, recording her voice. I never knew what I would do with these recordings. I thought maybe one day they would turn into an episode. Last weekend, I made that episode come to life. Take it from me, voice is far more attractive than 10,000 photos of your grandmother on your iPhone. Having her voice or having anyone's voice recorded is far more intimate. So I had two years of conversations and I thought I would share just the, the introduction to the episode I released as a tribute to her. And here it is. How are you, Rani? <laughs> How are you, Tata? <laughs> really, I love you. Oh, I love you too. Habibi. Love my Tata. There's no one else I would drive three hours stuck in traffic for other than my grandmother. I like uh, Taita to call me Laila, uh, Taita. Taita's easier, mm. yeah. I like. I cannot call you Afif. <laughs> yeah, yani, Afif, uh, you can say uh, Afu. It's much better. <laughs> okay, Afu. <laughs> <laughs> Storytelling is magic. I haven't mourned since she passed away. I have her with me in her story. I edited it, I put it together, doesn't matter. Uh, she lives on. And I think there's some power there beyond the political, beyond the sort of the bigger issues of history and politics and all that, just a love story. And I really, really treasure this, that I was able to turn, this, turn these conversations into an episode on the podcast. And there's something about an older woman's voice speaking about her memories. It's just beautiful. And I'd like to end this talk before we get into a discussion or a Q and A with the, uh, the quote from the broadcaster that I started with, Omar Zenni. The way I say it, it's not so impressive. I'd like you to hear it from an elderly lady who's been away for 50 years talking about her memory of that radio show. Oops. الدنيا قصص وحكايات وكليلة ودمنة وذكريات. Life is a series of tales and stories and fables and memories. That sounds so much better than anything I could ever do. With that, thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions or Mahmoud, if you want to steer the conversation, please feel free. Thank you very much for this, uh, Roni. This is actually great. Like uh, I am at loss for words, to be honest. Uh, is everyone disconnected? Nope, not at all. They actually, yeah, we have we have more people now who joined. I'm surprised. What are you talking about, Roni? We're like so into the video. We want more. That wasn't even oh, enough. Oops, sorry, sorry. Like my heart is beating with the information you have and the way you tell the story. I jumped in ahead of Mahmoud. I apologize, Professor. Uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. This is this is you. You take off some pressure off me now. So go ahead. It's beautiful to hear you because first of all, you're like so American, and then all of a sudden you have this passion <laughs> and draw. And the way you talk about our land, we I, I didn't grow up here, right? So I have this 
I don't have as much as connection as you do. So you, you, you bring that in, in a person, whether they grew up here or not. So I love the way you tell your story. I love how you're connected in such a compassionate way to the land, to the people and you're, it's beautiful. Like I'm really, really like almost in tears of like how lovely it is to just hear you talk about it. Um, Thank you. May, it's may I really who, who speak? I can't, I didn't catch your name, sorry. I'm Sandrella, Sandrella. Oh, you're, oh, you're the one who woke up at four in the morning. I'm the one that's 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> that's why you don't have your video on, because you're I'll, probably- I'll, I'll put my video on, I'll challenge oh, you to you are. Okay, there you are, yeah. <laughs> I'm here. No, but it was, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a morning person, so. Uh, so this is also like a little bit, uh, this is getting late now. No, but it was, it's just beautiful. Like I've been following you, your blogs, I've been reading your stories. And when Mahmoud just, when Professor Mahmoud right away put your name Mahmoud, in. Mahmoud, man, Mahmoud, khalas. You've earned your PhD. So, you know, I always tell people, it's not about using titles because they're fancy. It's, you know, you worked hard to earn it. So you've earned it. So I'm, I don't, you know, I'm very European in my thinking and American. So I don't use it as, you know, oh, you're a doctor, you're a professor. No, you've yeah. earned your title. You worked hard for it. In any case, um, Ronnie, did you? Uh, yes, well, I also say professor. No, I don't know. <laughs> there you go. I wasn't sure if you finished, but it's just so beautiful to listen to you and how you put us through that. And I mean, there are so many questions I'm sure all of us have. So I'm just, I think I'm just taking it in what you were just telling us. And you just speak without even notes anywhere. It just—it was so obvious. It's just there. I, I refuse to have any notes in front of me. So oh, it is all, all those all those mistake all those mistakes are raw and uh, they're yeah. in their place. I think. Yeah, I don't I don't take notes. And, well, I you know, love uh, them more. I'm, I'm glad you more I'm genuine glad. and more authentic. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned this and uh, the tour that I had. I never wrote it down, so it's a four-hour story that's somewhere in my in my mind. And whenever I give the tour again, there's a process I have to go through re remembering exactly what I say. Because it's a four hour script that's just long here. But no, I'm, I'm glad, I, I appreciate uh, the sort of, I, I apologize for these mistakes here and there, but that's, that's how it is. After when you haven't done it for a while. Right. When you make these small little mistakes in life and you're just applying that in your passion, yeah. which is what you're doing. So it becomes- also, it's, pr it's proof I haven't given the tour in quite some time. <laughs> ah, there you go. You're a little yeah. bit rusty is what you're trying to say. <laughs> me, me, I'm yeah. going to let somebody else jump in before I ask some of my questions. Uh, yeah, so first off, um, have, you, have you thought about, the, I'll, I'll get the actual questions based on what you said and everything you, you mentioned. And if anyone has any question, you can write it down in the chat or you can just jump in uh have have you thought about the about the possibility of doing some sort of virtual uh tour i have and i uh so i have my tour here in my bag i bring this with me whenever i travel i I've, I've been trying and i haven't found i haven't found the right way yet of uh of trying to at least have a few stops where they could be somewhat interactive. But I, I, I don't think it's an easy task because uh, Beirut, to really appreciate the city, you have to sweat, you have to smell the dust, you have to hear the construction and sort of overcome it. Uh, you have to see the intensity yourself. I'll give you an example. Uh, actually, a friend uh, rem reminded me of this earlier today. We all know the Holiday Inn Hotel. Yep. I think we've all walked by it or we've driven by it. I'm not, I'm not talking about the one in Verdun. I'm not talking about the 1990s one. I'm talking about the 1970s one in downtown. And we all know it's there. We've heard stories of that hotel. We've mostly driven by. And I think it would be a shame to try to tell the Holiday Inn story in a virtual tour. I think you need to see it. You need to see it with your own eyes. You need to see all the graffiti inside, the wartime graffiti. You need to see the bullets, the bullet holes up close. You need to see the shrapnel damage. You need to see the shell markings. You actually need to see what's left of the Holiday Inn sign at the top. You have to be afraid of it as well. 
the trees that keep growing inside, you can see the green line yourself. On a laptop, I don't, I just don't know. It's not, it's not the same. So I'm trying, I'm exploring it, but if it's not the right kind of emotion, I'd, I'd rather not. I'd rather just wait. Uh, <laughs> Paul is and saying you know, uh, use use VR. Well, I'm I wouldn't. So <laughs> you sure. know, man, I'm sure I'm sure there's ways to do it that I I mean I I'm no expert in the sort of digital stuff, but uh, I'm turning forty. I started doing this tour when I was in my early twenties. I still have some time, so I'll keep walking as long as I can. Yeah. Um. I have a lot of questions. So if anyone is interested in asking first, let me know because I will be pushing back against uh, against him a bit, try to uh, challenge a few things, particularly when it comes to Beirut and he already knows what I have to, to say about that. Uh, virtual tours of cities like Istanbul, uh, Rome, so it may be well possible to do it for Beirut, uh, Laura saying. Yeah, I think though I, I got him when it comes to what he's trying to do, in a sense, you have to feel the presence. But I mean, do you think it's worth it? Like I, because this is to start pushing back a bit. Is it this overly romanticizing kind of a city that is just infested with so many problems and, you know, uh, You're referring to the virtual or just- No, no, general? no, the-, the, the your story of Beirut, kind of. Yeah. I think you're allowed to feel exactly what you feel. And if you hate the city, it's your right. You have every reason to hate it. And I think you should hate the best story ever told. If it's the best story, every single emotion, you'll go through it. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll, you'll break down, you'll close the book and throw it, you'll come back to it later. So all these emotions, I think, are fair. And I think all of us can come to our own conclusion of which one sort of occupies us the most. And I'll say from my own experience, when things get too sensitive, when the injury gets too close, you can't. You can't share the story without it hurting to the point that you, you may collapse in the process. So I had to distance myself from it. And I think everyone in their own different way has had so much pain by just being here. I mean, it's, it's an unusual place that gives you so much joy and pain at once. And we don't need to even go into the topics. We all know what they are. I, live uh, in an, I mean, I, I live in an apartment that was quickly put back together after the August blast. And there's marking, there's damage all over the apartment. I still see it everywhere. Yet I feel great being here. So I, I see the damage, I live in the damage, and yet I feel at home. Uh, yeah, I... Every, everyone can, I think, uh, can experience those emotions on their terms. And if you have the flexibility to, to leave and come back, and your heart says it's time to depart, I mean, this is what Lebanese have been doing for forever. They let go and then they romanticize, a, from, they romanticize Lebanon from abroad. Our most famous authors do this. Our most famous film directors do this as well. Ziad Dwayri is now in Paris. He may be in New York later. He's not coming back anytime soon. But Lebanon is in him. And I think, uh, I think it's fine. I think if you have those feelings against Beirut, they're legitimate. But um, I think like any good story, you'll come back to it at some point. Yeah, because it, it perpetuates this kind of uh, romantic view of what Lebanon is such that it gets to the point whereby, again, I'm just trying to... Uh, look at it from a different perspective of maybe this is why there is uh, no justice. Maybe this is why there is people just accept the status quo and they adapt and then they romanticize and then they adapt and then they romanticize in a way. So maybe this is this plays an important part when it comes to the justice aspect that we never really actually um, rebelled against what this city has become. And of course, as a city being governed by, you know, blah, 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 without getting into details, but you know, it's, it's maybe partly us. Malta, in the middle of the Mediterranean, a lazy island, has no problems. It's, I think, 400,000 people that speak a very distant dialect that sounds like Lebanese, 
Sicilian Arabic, which got sent over to Malta. We can understand them, or at least half of what they're saying. They look like us, they sound like us. They're among the most boring people in the world. And because they have a very boring, very unaffected island, and they're left alone. So yeah. Um, had we not gone through so much pain and agony, had not every Middle Eastern conflict impacted this country as well, I think we wouldn't have a very good story to share. So maybe within the tragedy comes storytelling by default. And yeah, I, I agree to a point. I agree that uh, seeking justice or searching for it, poetic justice, you don't need to do that when you have a functioning state. When you don't have one, that's all you're left with. Uh, yeah, it says uh, so uh, Jack is also, I think, asked the, the more or less the same question. How would you compare uh, uh, the romanticized version of Beirut versus the struggle to live here and the ability to change things here? So it's, it's kind of... The, the struggle to live in Beirut, meaning... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's not, this, this does not sort of uh, take, the pain is real. It's not sort of an imagined pain. So there's, I mean, if uh, storytelling can only do so much when it comes to trying to heal some of this pain, but absolutely, I mean, the, the, the issues are so profound today that um, we're living through one of the most difficult times in Lebanese history, it may well be the most difficult, so. Storytelling can only just sort of get you out of it for a while, but uh, it's not the solution, of course. Uh, or maybe not, or maybe it is, it is, this is, if it's uh, the creating, like I was, I was thinking about it also from a different perspective in relation to what you said with regards to academia, maybe this kind of storytelling eventually uh, documents and archives and creates a, a historical memory in a way that would get people to really know what happened. Like, and in relation to civil war, in relation to things, to all the shit that has been happening, without this personal story, people would not really be able to identify or to, many of us, at least uh, those who grew up in the 90s, uh, we don't even know shit about what was going on. I agree. I think collective memory, if I think this is what you're sort of- uh, Yeah, historical collective, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I know that this happens on an emotional level. I think of my childhood in Hamra, and often I sort of think of West Beirut by accident. And it's not my story, that's a movie. But it's, it's kind of feels familiar. So those characters on the Corniche, or walking into downtown, or up to no good, I identify with it. And I, I agree. I think maybe our emotions evolve with collective memory, and we kind of, we allow for a narration to take hold. Yes, yes, that's true. And, and maybe it builds something long-term, um, but I'm, I'm only sort of, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to match what's happening now. With the, with the pure joy of storytelling, because things are so bad at the moment that I think it's difficult to actually reflect enough right now. I've actually had this type of conversation with other storytellers who haven't been able to write about the last few months because it just hurts too much. But that said, I think, I, I agree. I, sh I share that sentiment that collective memory does offer maybe a, uh, a record to turn to later. And we can look back and maybe see things in, in in, in a clearer way, perhaps. Uh, and to reflect on without, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, our version of Dostoevsky storytelling rooted in tragedy, in his case, self-inflicted and ours quite imposed. This is Paul saying, yeah, so this is kind of something to, uh, or-, uh, or I, I, recognize, I recognize this guy from Twitter. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 even the way he writes the tweet, I can see it. Yes, hello, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, maybe it's it's this because it's it's not politic, not politically charged in the Lebanese uh, sense. So you just present your story at a personal level, and then you would hope others would do that as well. And that's how we relate. So it's yeah, I I would 
prefer that much more than reading uh, a very dry account of what happens or of Beirut or of history, et cetera. So that, that for me at least makes much more sense. Uh, There's very little joy in reading a, um, a PhD dissertation on the Lebanese civil war, even though that's where you need to fact check. And I, I want to emphasize this not to sort of sort of trash talk academ academia too much here. But when I was giving the tour, uh, I had to have a reference point to make sure that I wasn't exaggerating or that I wasn't making anything up. I had to make sure that it was fact. So that's where you turn to. You don't go to the archive to find a good story. You go there to find a source. But the storytelling technique, I think, depends on making sure you're not, you're not making things up. So they both serve a function, I think. You know, West Beirut, the, the film, and then Kamel Salibi's A House of Many Mansions, two different ways of telling the same, Samir Asir, all of the above, these are different ways of sharing the same story. And I think they all, they, they all kind of, they complement one another. And you, maybe uh, we can sort of get into a bit of this. Uh, I, I consider you maybe to a point in this world as well. I mean, you're a self-employed podcaster and I, I don't know if you're podcasting anymore, sort of. I mean, it, there's a lot of individual expression in storytelling that you cannot do in academia. So that's where, maybe that's the other side of academia where you're not encouraged to be sensitive. Storytelling, you need to be sensitive. And if it comes from the gut, I think it's, it's appropriate in storytelling, maybe not in, in uh, in, the, in a dissertation, but they both serve a function, I think, in remembering what happened and, and trying to interpret it. Yeah, uh, and uh, in, in, in relation to this, uh, uh, Eliane is asking, uh, as such, why, why Beirut and not, for example, Tripoli or other cities? Well, that's because there are people from Tripoli, and I, I should say this, I am technically from Tripoli. <laughs> Technically, technically, like everyone's technically from somewhere here that they don't affiliate, they, they don't find to be home. I'm, I'm from Tripoli a while ago. There's somebody who's doing a, a storytelling tour there. There are people much better at doing it and, and it happens. It's just now because of COVID, it's, it's inappropriate to try to do this. It just wouldn't make sense. And I think we'd all get arrested trying to do it now if we had a group of 80 people walking around Beirut, we'd all be sort of taken away, regardless of where you are. But there are people in Tripoli that do something, that, that do similar things. And they're very good. So it's not, of course, it's not limited to Beirut, but I think Beirut is a better story, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, yeah, because like I, we, we even, I, I walked with you the other day on, on Bliss and it was, it's, it's fascinating, like for where does this uh, originally, the connection that you feel to, to Beirut or come from? It's like why, I, I, you said maybe it happened by, by chance at the beginning, et cetera, but uh, why do you feel at home here? Like what's, where is this feeling coming from? I don't know. It's because you, the way you talk about, it, like I saw you in action, kind of, you know, and you were so fascinated and passionate about it. It's, I would think to myself, like you, you haven't lived, uh, maybe those uh, in the fifties and sixties. So, uh, I'm a fan of of detail and I like to observe. And maybe that's part of it, that the city is full of details and maybe you need to scratch the surface a bit to see it. And uh, I like just watching. And Beirut, what do you do when you have, I mean, you people are just watching each other, they're watching life go by and it's in me. So maybe, maybe that's the, that's the personal foundation but the story became personal over time when people, yeah. I admired, when people I admired were getting killed for a, a similar passion. Samir Asir was, was profound to me and I was younger, but he was an academic and somebody I could relate to. 
somebody that I thought of as, as a decent person who, yeah, if he's seeking political power, that's the kind of person you would want in the, in the halls of government in, in Lebanon. And to watch him get killed, uh, I think was, uh, was it, had, it, it shook me to my core, actually. Um, I didn't include this in the slides, I removed it, but uh, I was sitting in Sesin in Ashrafi the day he was killed. I decided to pull this out of the slides at the last minute. Uh, I was reading a book about Beirut in Sesin and across the street, Samir Asir's car bombing. And everyone in Beirut in this group now, if you've lived here, you know what the car bombing is like. You know it, you hear it, the echo, the, the, the reverberation, the glass, the screaming, the, the panic. This was in 2005. 2005, there's no Facebook, no Instagram, no Twitter. You don't know what's happening. You just run. And I remember this. I actually let go of the book I was reading about Beirut, running from the assassination of a man who loved Beirut and trying to understand what happened. And maybe that's in me, maybe. It's trying to make sure that people like that, who I respected, that their lives are not wasted. And I think that's something uh, maybe that falls more into purpose and pursuit. And it just happened to line up here for me. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's interesting because we, we even spoke about this on, on your first uh, podcast and you were, I was asking you like, why, <laughs> you know, and you're like, yeah, it's uh, seeking in a way some sort of justice. And that's. Yeah, it, there is something about seeking justice when you're unable to get it the right way. In my opinion, seeing a, uh, uh, the, the criminal in jail, that's justice. And in Lebanon, these crimes go unpunished. So you pursue justice in, in the most peaceful way possible. And that's poetic justice. This is way before my father was assassinated. Yeah, yeah. So like, this is years and years earlier. But uh, I'm sure it's in my DNA. He loved Beirut too. Mm. He ended up moving back to Lebanon after the civil war several times. So his passion, I think uh, was also, I mean, I, I lived it, I identified with it and maybe that's in me as well. But that, that came later and I've held on to it um, in, in different ways. Um, and I'm... But I, I'll just say one thing, I'll say one thing. I don't uh, have any judgment on anyone. And I just saw a comment. I think it was, uh, well, it's from you, Sandrella. I'm sorry. Sandrella, yeah. You have a yeah. sense of belonging to Beirut that, yeah. we, that many are losing and don't have. I, I, I'm not blind to how many people want to just forget this place altogether. So I, I, I appreciate that too. I mean, I uh, 2020 vision if you will, playing on a pun here, the year that went by, clarity at that level is not a, it's not a good thing. You don't want to see the pain that clearly. So I, I don't blame anyone who, uh, who seeks a life elsewhere or who wants to let go of the story altogether. I, I don't have any judgment. And the reason why I'm asking you this, and uh, again, if anyone has anything to say or ask, please feel free to do, but uh, because ironically, my story with the city and Lebanon also starts at the archives. And this is why I'm asking, because is it so the more I know, the more it, it, it becomes uh, clearer to me or the more I, I develop some sort of affinity to this place. And I don't know if this makes sense, but my the, again, I was working at the archives, so I was being exposed to uh, primary sources, history. I I found the uh, Samir Asir book, Beirut, and I read, uh, not the entire book, but then I needed a few things. So I read that, Kamal Salibis as well, you know. So I've, I was exposed to this, but from the more dry sense. And then I started talking to people because it fascinated me, that part of uh, the, the history. And the more I know, the more I understand. And the more I understand, it seems that I, I develop some sort of, um, I don't know what to call it because I, I'm still not there whereby I would, you know, uh, I don't feel at home here yet. 
but I can now understand why others do. So is it because of the because I'm I know more about it? I know more about the other side of those who've been through different stages and epics in, in Lebanon? Is it because of the stories? Like I've heard stories from those who lived through the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, and then you you watch the uh, the movies, uh, West Beirut or Philippe Alatinji is also the 06, and then he, you know, it's his story as well. So is it that you think, because I've lived in Beirut for like, for all my life, but I never had that kind of view of it, or I, I cannot explain it, like I cannot articulate it because my view is like, no, this is a shitty place. I never had any emotions in the AUB archive. I'll start there. So the AUB I archive, did. Yeah, so that's an interesting, I, I never, I was there just to fact check. I never found any sort of uh, solace or uh, catharsis in, uh, in the archive at AUB. But, but I will say that yes, uh, when you discover truth, and I say this carefully here, when you, when you discover your inner truth, I think something about that, it sets you free. Hmm. And we're, we're locked here and we're always constrained and there's a lot of stress and agony. And when I think when you understand it, something about it is, it's okay. And I think that's, that's maybe part of the, just what it's like to be from this part of the world. It's not an easy place to digest. It's, it's not an easy place to, to share on a walking tour. It took time for me to actually find a way to explain how we got here. And uh, I mean, every chapter of modern history has had good and bad consequences in this tiny little part of the world. And it's impacting us all the time. So yeah, I think I agree that when you're able to step back from it and see it and, and just accept it uh, as, as a very, 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 very long-winded story, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a sort of, there's an easiness there. I, I found it actually on the tour when I would be able to share things that were coming back to life. You know, and, and that's something maybe it gets into what you're saying. Martyrs Square is a parking lot. We don't like to admit this. Yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> people don't like to, it's, Martyrs Square maybe has a weight. There's a there's a weightiness there, right? And it's it's meant to mean something. And then if we if any of us walk to Martyrs Square right now, imagine you're not from Beirut, and you're walking across Martyrs Square, you would really think strange city puts parking lot right in the middle. It's almost like the best parking space possible, right? I I think I find real joy in sharing what Martyrs Square looked like and right where we're seated and bringing it to life. And that's maybe part of it, that's the truth and that you understand it, you accept it. You also accept why the heart of Beirut is a parking lot today for all the wrong reasons and you kind of just, you accept it, it's the story. Maybe then, maybe then it's easier to navigate this mess. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I, I mean, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's borderline criminal that the most sacred part of the city is just left as a sort of almost like a wasteland. Which was also interesting, like... Uh... And, and that's not because of the protests or the th the the, uh, the demonstrations or the bra the rioting. It's got nothing to do with that. That's the municipality that left it as a mess. So, I mean, this is government sort of leaving it as is. And that's yeah. that's a... Yeah. And here comes the, the urban planning part and, and people who are pushing for a better... Uh, uh, design or at least uh, raise some sort of awareness when when it comes to that I always make fun of it reclaiming public spaces but I mean they do have a point up to a certain point what I disagree with is uh, you know underlying kind of uh, ideology but uh, yeah parking space place to protest uh, I'm going to offer a comparison I, I'll try to offer a comparison because Beirut should not be special to that degree it shouldn't be the only place in the world that you can have all these emotions at once. I went on a walking tour almost 20 years ago in Berlin. Now, German 
urban planning and Beirut urban planning has nothing in common. German history and Lebanese history, nothing in common. There's nothing Lebanon, there's nothing Lebanese in Germany and there's very little German in Lebanon, right? So two countries, very different experiences. But when I was in Berlin, I took a walking tour there. I felt something that I feel here. A lot of bad things happened and it feels better when you know about it and understand it. And I'm not German. I'm not a Berliner, yet I felt it. And I'll give you one, it's, it sounds like a silly example, but it, it resonated with me because we're talking about parking lot in Martyrs Square. No, sort of an, a residential neighborhood, but an unpleasant one. More or less in the heart of Berlin, quiet, sort of a Soviet era design. So it's not very not aesthetically appealing. Weeds are growing and sort of concrete. Group of us are just standing together and the narrator, the storyteller, says we're standing right on top of Hitler's bunker. And you'd never know. There's no information, there's no plaque, there's nothing commemorating Hitler's bunker, but it's right below you. When you discover that, when you're able to see it, there's something about it, it makes you feel almost like you, you understand it. And you understand why people may not want to remember where this bunker is. And there's a psychology there. There's a, almost like a, um, it's a relationship. Berlin suffered too much. Berlin was divided. Berlin, you couldn't cross. Berlin was bombed repeatedly. The Cold War was very unkind to Berlin. And then the last 30 years, Berlin has been heading in the right direction. This is where Beirut and Berlin diverge completely. But we have that kind of story too. And we can explain it that way. Why we're too quick to forget, why we neglect, why we prefer erasing rather than remembering. And I think there's something there. And, and when, when you overcome it, when you realize that's not the way to handle tragedy, when you sort of embrace it and understand it, maybe, maybe that's the better way. Of, of, of maybe just living in Beirut and experiencing uh, the city. This is a very, it's a very amateur way of explaining it, but I, I think it's, there's, some, there's a catharsis in understanding. Uh, yeah, speaking of tragedy and catharsis and uh, stories, here comes the, I would uh, in, invoke Nietzsche here and the birth of tragedy and why these storytellings, these uh, art, artistic, uh forces come into play for us to be able to yeah to purge ourselves from all these feelings in a way of fear and pity and stuff like that but you you did mention that uh, renewal instead of renovation which i think says it all absolutely i mean i and it's it's erasing yep erasing almost a hundred years of architectural beauty that will have permanent scars on anyone living here. And that is not war related, which adds to it. This is not, uh, these are not bombs from the sky. This is not uh, militia trying to sort of break through neighborhoods, it's nothing like that. This is a company hired to restore a section of Beirut. And they went with profit seeking motives that you don't usually associate with when it comes to urban planning or when you, associated with reconstruction, that cities are not meant to transform that dramatically. And we, we erased, we erased a lot of the good stuff that we, we were once proud of. So yeah, that, um, that definitely yeah, and, uh, I can I'm only think of uh, Roger Scruton here when, when he talks about uh, yeah, beauty and in this case, renovation and how yeah. to do it and yeah but that's that's uh for me paul is saying i think we are afraid to accept the pain because it seems to never stop we fear we won't be able to finish the stages of grief before we have to start over i mean unfortunately for us unfortunately because berlin is another it's just a similar story that it was in pain for a long time but they've had three decades to sort of put that behind them we're still in the pain. And I think that's that's really, that's the story that this is 2020, we experienced one of the most 
horrifying disasters, man-made. And it's not, this is 30 years, 31 years since the civil war ended. See, this is in a, this is in a, what I was trying to, to say at, at the beginning, because with the historical memory, I think they call it, it's like creating some sort of collective memory such that not without, without the uh, political underpinnings, it's just to say things as are instead of completely erasing. Like if you, if you look at uh, maybe Berlin, they do have, uh, I, I know more about the, 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 the case of Spain. So there's a lot going on in Spain with cultural production, stories, movies, uh, books, novels, which I think up to a certain point, I don't know if it's not that we miss it here. It's just that uh, it's here and there, it seems. So this is why we tend to forget. And in Spain, it's, it's there, it's present. You cannot forget it in a way, kind of. Uh, the, the civil war, dictatorship, etc. you know. Yeah. And, yeah, and those places have had time, I think. They've had the right amount of time to reflect. But they I did think... reflect. I, we, we miss that here. Uh, yeah. We do miss that part. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it would be, I think it would be silly for us to say that we had a 15-year civil war and that's that. No, we've had about half a century of, of disorder. Yeah. And that, I mean, that has impacted several generations. It's not just uh, the Civil War generation or the post-war. So we, we're all in this together. And uh, if I can just take a step back, though, to this just storytelling and the pursuit of it. Uh, I, I, years ago, when I was giving the tour, for better, I mean, just there were news outlets that were common that Wall Street Journal joined the tour, which for me was funny. It's like, what was the Wall Street Journal covering a tour in Beirut? They, they included it in some larger tourism uh, piece, but I was featured in it and they did a video with me and I looked so ridiculous for the Wall Street Journal. T-shirt and short sunglasses, walk Beirut t-shirt. And I don't think I really was the right guy for them, right? but they, they did a video on me. So I got, people recognized me. And there were a lot of people that were curious, and who's this guy trying to share Beirut's story? Uh, one man in particular, a, a complicated man, a Lebanese American scholar. Uh, his name was Fouad Hajami. I don't know if that name rings a bell to anyone. It, I'll, I'll just share a few. He is Syrian. No, he's not Syrian. He wrote a book called The Syrian Rebellion. I think Paul just wrote he is Syrian, yeah. but no, he's Lebanese but detached and later in his life he was american oh I now think... i know why uh, who's who then yeah you mentioned him i think before yeah but go ahead yeah i mean american but lebanese for ed ajami you know you're a lebanese man right you can't get away from it even as hard as you try from arnoun anyway left beirut as a teenager uh would return on occasion but for the maybe last three decades of his life didn't set foot in Lebanon. In a lot of pain, he would write regularly. And I mean, he was ostracized for being so, so critical. Uh, Self-hating Arab was usually the sort of title for him. I don't think he really cared about the title, but he wrote wonderful stories of Beirut from New York. And he was going back in his own mind remembering his childhood growing up in Beirut, the way he described things, I mean, for me, was so beautiful. And there was a, there was a bitterness, but it was matched with, with beauty. So you can kind of give both at the same time. He was upset with Beirut, but he remembered how beautiful it was at the same time. And he's, de he's detached. He would email me on occasion, just sort of curious. It's like, you know, what are you doing? Not, I, we, we had communication back and forth. He wrote one chapter of a book called Dream Palace of the Arabs. It's a chapter about Khalil Hawi. He's a poet. I think you, you know the name, Mahmoud, Khalil Hawi. An AUB professor and a poet, a complicated man, shifting political ideologies. He couldn't choose between Lebanese nationalism Syrian nationalism, Arab nationalism. I think he flirted with all. And then in June of 1982, he's on his balcony 
the Israeli invasion, he commits suicide. And the story is about one poet giving up on Beirut. And I think we're going to have these stories emerge. And that's 40 years ago, he wrote this story. We're going to be writing the same kind of story where we're in constant pain. I think that's part of it. That's why the stories are so beautiful. And I think that's why it's very difficult to kind of step back and reflect is because the pain is so severe and we're always holding on to something that was once beautiful and is not anymore. And I really loved a story about a poet that commits suicide. That doesn't make sense. I should be so revolt. I should be repulsed. I should have so much anger. Yet I loved every word of that story. And this is a man killing himself in Beirut in 1982. But for in a very limited way, in an amateur way, I find myself there. I find myself talking about my father, talking about his assassination, something that hurts. I mean, sort of scarred me for life. Yeah. But I love writing about it. And I love when I can, when it's appropriate, sharing it. And for me, it's art. It's a form of art. So I, I don't know. If you're, if you're prone to be a storyteller, I'll just sort of take it back there for a moment. There really is no better place to be from. If you're a, uh, if you're a computer science engineer and you want constant internet and a reliable sort of uh, you know, electricity grid and you want fresh dollars and you want all of the above, or if you're a lawyer and you want to really have the law to work with, if you're maybe many different careers, maybe your talents are best served elsewhere for the, for the time being. Maybe, maybe. But storytelling, I think it's, it's still meant to be here. But that's my opinion. Yeah, and I, I think this is also uh, very interesting. I think I, I will be uh, wrapping it up with uh, one more question on uh, something we discussed on your second podcast. Uh, so is, is and, uh, well, since you mentioned it, I'm not sure you actually, but anyway, your book, is there some sort of novel or book or something along the lines there? Has you decided to uh, go ahead with it or not? Uh, yes, I have. I have, I have less than half of it done. Uh, I, I lost a, well, I, I don't have a publisher anymore. I kind of was late. I, I decided to do other things while I was meant to send the rest of the manuscript. So I, th there is something coming eventually, yes, yeah. Uh, but it, the story has changed because I, I stopped writing before the, I stopped writing before the blast and really like as the protests started in October. So there's a lot to maybe, uh, I have to reincorporate a few things and I may have to remove other things, but no, there is something happening, yes. Uh, more yes. of a novel kind of thing or just... Uh, um... I am not as ambitious as you. So. <laughs> oh, then, how, no. I'm... I don't I, I don't have the, the guts or the courage to self-publish. Um, and I think it, I, my understanding is that it's not the right length, it has to be longer. Oh. for it to be published. And I still believe in, in publishing rather than self-publishing. I don't think I have what it takes to self-publish. So one day it'll come out, but it'll come out, I think the right length and uh, the right storyline. It has, it has shifted a bit. Okay. Uh, well, good luck uh, with that. And uh, thank you. Yeah. What I, what I will say is that uh, writing in general, which I've been doing in different magazines recently, uh, it helps, helps oh. the process. So when you're forced to write about related subjects, you come back to what you're meant to write. It sort of, it, it lends itself well. Uh, yeah, and uh, in this case, Jack is also uh, has a question. How do you personally approach the storytelling without going into the different versions of reality that each group, uh, each Lebanese group has about it? Says, uh, that's, yeah. that's a very good question. Uh, I stopped the, the 
2005. So that was a deliberate decision to end the tour with Samir Asir's assassination. There was a moment that I would jump to my father's assassination, but I would jump in and jump back out. And that's 2013 and that's, and that's one event. So maybe I had the ability to halt 15, 16 years ago with a storyteller's uh, death. But the sensitivities around the war, which militia did what, who exactly uh, occupied the green line, which years and who killed who and why and all that stuff. I mean, you could end up with maybe a 400 hour tour and then uh, you'd end up just having everyone shouting at each other and screaming at each other. So I, I, deliberately, I deliberately offered the wider picture. So main events that happened at the Holiday Inn, I would address them but I wouldn't get into the unnecessary details at explaining what happened there. Martyr's Square and the, the story I shared with you at the beginning, that may be the most personal I ever got on the tour where I addressed it. I shared something that happened to me. But for the most part, I think I managed. I managed to speak about currency, architecture, urban planning, uh, Roman baths, French mandate influence, souks underneath a shopping mall named Souks Shopping Mall, things like that. I think I could sort of steer clear from the very sensitive subjects, which should be addressed, but I don't think it's possible to do that on a four hour walking tour. And it's, it, I think it doesn't need to be done because the competing versions of modern history, in particular, how it relates to the Civil War, to me, they're not so interesting when it comes to storytelling. I think that's unnecessary friction. I think the wider picture is better. And you can do that. Beirut gives you enough. You, you can do that without it being, uh, you know, overtly sensitive to one side or the other. I learned from one man in particular, and that's Ziad Dwayde. He did both. He did West Beirut, and he spoke about the leftist, pro-Palestinian, primarily Muslim part of the city. He followed up with the insult five years ago. East Beirut's insecurities, Christian Beirut, the anti-PLO segment of the city. He's able to do both, and he, did, he delivered justice to both sides, I think. He was able to be fair to both sides. I think that's a way to do it. But when it comes to just narrating a city's past, I don't think you need to get into those subjects in particular. And I don't find them particularly interesting. Bashir Jmeyil and Yasser Arafat and you know the names that are familiar with the war, even the ones that have emerged post-war for the most part, I don't find them particularly interesting to even offer a story. Interesting, yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you have any other thing to say to end the talk, which was very, very interesting. And I think people uh, agree with me on this one. And I've even several people already DM me saying they love the talk. So. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm a bit amateur at talking this way. I do podcasting for a living, but I'm usually sort of the one asking questions, not answering. So uh, forgive me for the sort of uh, my amateurness here and there and the sort of a little errors here and there. Uh, I'll just suggest a few things if I can. Um, follow the podcast because I have many stories there and it's not just politics. It's not just the protests the last 18 months. I have standalone stories. Uh, there's one I love and the voice at the end, the elderly woman talking about Zenni and the broadcasting. This is from what may be my favorite episode. It's called El Wedi. It's uh, episode 170. It's three Lebanese Jews from Wedi Abu Jmir, from the heart of Beirut, living abroad. Three generations, three voices, each with a different relationship to Lebanon. And hers, she's the eldest in the group, and she was impacted severely by Lebanon, and it comes out in the story. But uh, I find that story fascinating because Wadi Abu Jmir is worse than Martyr's Square. 
at least Martyr's Square still has the statue, Wadi Abu Jamil is gone. The synagogue is locked and it's hidden, but aside from that, you would never know that there was a flourishing Lebanese Jewish community in downtown. So I love that way of storytelling. Um, I also shared a story recently about my encounters with Robert Fisk, a storyteller who I used to run into regularly on the Corniche. So I share my relationship with Fisk and I kind of tease it. I, 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 write, I end up writing an obituary about him. He wrote an obituary of my father. I ended up writing an obituary about him. And there's sort of a cycle there that comes out in the story. And um, I think every single subject, I hope by now every subject is in there as well. So there's playlists, there's topics you can, you can, uh, you can choose from. And if anyone can supply vaccines throughout the world, I'm ready to give the tour again. So once that's ready, I'd like to do this once again and be honored to have anyone in the group who's in, in Lebanon at the moment to join. I, I'd really, I miss doing that tour, so. And I'll be there as well. Uh, and uh, just a storyteller. Uh, yeah, Laura is concurring with you about uh, Fisk. And I'll end it on this uh, note uh, by Aline saying Good. she yeah. took part in a Walk Beirut tour a few years ago. And it was refreshing and so nice to hear all those stories. You made us fall in love with a city that is not always easy to love. I think I remember Aline. And the reason I remember her, I mean, mind you, thousands, more than 10,000 people joined this tour, but I think I know wow. who this is. And I, she can comment if it's her, it, it, I think it's her. This, Aline sent me a message on Facebook uh, years later saying, <laughs> it's her, it's <laughs> saying uh, something along the lines of, uh, you're a politician's son? <laughs> almost like you're the guy giving the tour and you're yeah I, I thought that was funny I like that she's like um ah uh, that's her good good it was a it was in jest she's like you're not the typical politician's son you know you're you're yeah, I, I enjoyed that moment with her so yeah that's her interesting yeah so uh, uh thank you very much for this Ronnie this was uh, really great and uh, we'll follow this up with uh, another talk uh, as promised sometime in the coming few weeks. Yeah, maybe if I can just say something. I would yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Skimmed over my father and I skimmed over a lot of the stuff that I sort of, uh, they were very nice to offer two different uh, talks. So I would, yeah, it would be nice to share a bit more about that and maybe just sovereignty and state building and, and the, uh, the mess we're in, at least when it comes to the politics of, of where we are. So I look forward to that as well. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you offering that. Uh, we'll uh, we'll keep you guys posted. Thanks again for joining the chat, the talk. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. And thanks again, uh, Ronnie, for this. And uh, the talk will be uploaded on YouTube. I'll share it with you uh, via email, and then I'll share uh, on Twitter as well. So, thanks. Thank you, Mahmoud. Have a good day. Cheers.